Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to teach you how to go beyond what we have learned so far in this series, which is how to work with individual units of data coming into Grasshopper components, and then how to work with streams of data or with multiple units of information. I would like to focus specifically on how Grasshopper components deal with the execution of streams of incoming data. And I would like to do some examples about how to work with lists of data in particular as inputs. And let me show you what I mean with streams of data and how Grasshopper handles this, whatever. What we have done so far is that we know how to create a Grasshopper component, right? We know how to say, well, the input here has to be of the type 0.3D, whatever. And then if I double click here, you can see that my component now takes one point as an input and then takes, uh, spits out something over the output A, right? And then if I were, if, if I were to plug in to this component, a wire con containing a data structure such as this one, uh, which is a grasshopper data tree, it has branches, it has list and it has three items per list. If I were to do that, something very interesting will happen. The component has no code whatsoever right now, but we can see that the component is already doing something. And very interestingly, it's outputting a data structure that has the same structure as the original that we're uh, inputting here. Why is that happening? How is that happening? I have not written a single line of code in the Grasshopper component. How, how on, earth, on earth is this then happening like this? Well, it turns out that Grasshopper has a very, very specific way of how it handles data, that, how it handles inputs that have not just one element, but multiple elements. And the idea is that we can control the behavior of the component depending on the type of data that we are receiving. So for example, the default is that Grasshopper components work with individual units of data. What that means is that if I say nothing, this component, which is working with each one of the points, what it's going to do is that it's going to execute one time for each one of these elements that are coming in. And then it's going to output the results of that operation for each one of the items in the same structure as it was given it as an input. So for example, if I have nine points divided in three lists and three branches in a data tree, then this component is going to take each one of those components and it's going to execute this function, the run script function, for each one of the points individually. All right? And the result of that operation, whatever we output for A, so for example, A equals, hey, I made a calculation. Then each one of those is going to be output in a mirroring structure to the one that was given as an input. So I, if I give it more points, then more strings are going to be output. But if I give it less, then less strings are going to be output. I am not writing in this component a for loop anywhere that is outputting like lists of data. But because the component by default is set to only work with each one of the elements at a time, then that's why the output is nine different messages, each one of them corresponding to the nine different input points that I have here in my component, all right? And I'm going to maximize this because we know that there's a surface that it gets subdivided. So let's just make this a little larger. That default behavior is what's called item access and is the default in C Sharp script components, for example. However, that can be changed. The idea is that when I right click here, we've gone a little over this section here that defines what kind of access we want to have to the data that is coming in. Do we want to just make the component work with each one of the items individually? Or do we want the component to work with the lists that are coming in? Or do we want the component to work with the whole data tree at once? All right. How do we want that? Well, right now, because we have item access, we can see that inside the input P is 
a single point 3D object. But look at what's going to happen. If I were to click here and change to list access, what would happen would be that my input is not a point 3D object anymore. Now Grasshopper has automatically turned it into a list of points. And very interestingly, because this data tree contains three lists of points, then this component doesn't execute nine times anymore. It executes three times, which, are the, the, which is the amount of lists that I have in this data tree. And I get a data tree that has the same structure, but no elements. And I don't know what is going on with this. Um, I don't know what's going on with this. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. And actually, I'm kind of curious about what's going on here. So what if I do that? And then what, why cannot A be a, a message here? Okay, so that was, I don't, I really don't understand what was going on. Hey, I made a calculation. All right. So you can see now the component has executed three times. Maybe it would be clearer if I have a different number of elements here. So yes, so more lists with less elements. You can see this data tree now has four, now has five lists with two elements each. So now on the tree, because we have five lists, this component has executed five times instead of 10, which is the number of elements that we have here. Correct? Does this make sense? But that also means that now, if I were to write code inside of my component, I would have a list with these two points, then it would run again with a list of these two points, it would run again with a list of these two points, and these two points here. If I knew how to work with data tree, which is what we're going to do in the next video, then what I could do is I could say, well, instead of list, just give me the whole thing. All right, just give me the whole thing. And if you do, then I'm going to, I don't know, I don't know why that fails. But what you can see is that now because it's taken the whole com data tree as an input, so it's not a list anymore, it's a data tree. The data tree is the whole thing, the whole chunk itself. And because it's taking the whole list, the whole data tree of information, that's why the component now only runs one time because it's given all the information at once. All right. Does this make sense? This is very interesting. Grasshopper manages all of this for us. We don't need to care about triggering the component several times or feeding in the information. That is one of the nice things that we have when we script inside of Grasshopper that this component somehow, the Grasshopper engine handles the execution of this component four times, one time with the data tree, with the list, whatever that is. It takes the data, it crunches it. And the only thing that we need to take care of is saying, I want to work with each one of the elements, or I want to work, I want to work with lists of elements, or I want to work with the whole data tree at once. Yeah, I am going to select that behavior here, and then Grasshopper will take care of managing the rest, the executions, the list, etc., etc. So this is extremely important because it's fundamental to how Grasshopper works. And then because also, and also is very important because very often ourselves, we will not, we will need to work with data that is more than just individual units. We will need to create, for example, geometry based on collections of data, like interpolating a curve over a series of points like we did in the exercise number three, or interpolating or lofting a surface over a set of curves, which is what we're going to do in this video. Okay, so let me show you a couple examples of applications that could be useful for, um, uh, for applications that can be useful if instead of working with item elements, we work with lists as inputs. So for example, the first example is going to be extremely straightforward. It's going to be given a list of numerical values, calculating the average of all those values. So how can we do that? I have a C sharp script component here that I already tuned and I changed the name with the paint bucket to average. I, it has one input that is called S. So it's going to be a series of numbers. 
and it has an output that is called AVG, the average. Okay. So <clears throat> the first thing that I need to do is I need to remember to type the input and to make it a double because it can take any kind of number. And the other thing that I would like to do is to remind us that if I leave it like that, we're not going to be able to calculate the average of anything because we're going to be given single numbers per instance of the script running. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that instead of one value as an input, I have a list of values as an input. And that we're going to do by right clicking here and typing list access. And then as I do that, you can see that now the input has changed from one single double to a list of doubles as an input. If I plug this in here now and I copy this, I can probably now start writing my code. So as we typically do, my algorithm, my outputs and the algorithm, um, I, you probably know this if you are familiar with the C -sharp scripting, what we're going to do is we're going to add all the numbers together and we're going to divide the result of that addition by the number of elements that we have. So we're going to start by the addition, we're going to uh, create a variable called sum, which we're going to start by zero, and then we're going to iterate over the list. So int i equals zero, i is less than the amount of elements on the list, i plus plus, and then what we're going to do here, we could have also iterated with a for each, that's absolutely fine too. And we're going to say sum, we need to increase it by the value of s in position y. So each one of the elements, one at a time. And then the average is going to be equal to the sum of those values divided by how many numbers did we have on the list. All right. And then I'm going to, yeah, average. And then here, the output AVG, that's the output of the component, is going to be equal to the average value. Okay. So how does that work? Well, um, we have this value. I actually kind of not don't have a way to compare in this. Uh, there's a, I believe there's a component in Grasshopper that does means. Let me, let me double check. Oh yes, I found it. Sorry. It was under maths, utilities. There's an average component here. And then what we can do is we can plug this in here and double check. And yes, it basically we had the right result. Okay. So that's great, for example. Uh, but again, the most important part here is that we were able, if we had had this as item access, you can see that oh, we cannot work because we don't have a list, it's just single units, and that the component runs once for each one of the inputs. So it will be running one for each one of the, so we cannot, we need to be able to look at the list as a whole, not at each one of the elements individually. All right. Okay, so let's see a very similar example. Let me put this back to work. Let's see a very similar example about how to take a collection of curves and loft a surface uh, through those curves. Let's get hands on. So I have drawn in Rhino three curves that are in three dimensional space. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on curve, set multiple curves and bring them all in. I have connected a native loft component that you can see is generating this B rep through the set of curves. And of course, if I, if I change any of the original ones, if I change any of the original ones, then the component, everything updates correspondingly, right? And then uh, generates that B rep. And then I have also dropped a C sharp script component that I have already renamed and uh, used the paint bucket. The input is called C, the output is called L. And I need to remember to say that the input needs to be of the type curve. And where am I? It needs to be of the type curve that is right over here. And I should move myself to the other side at some point, right? <laughs> this is getting bad. I should, this is curve. And then I also need to remember that if I start working with the component right away, my input will be single curves. And in order to make the loft, I need to be able to look at the full list of curves as a whole. So that's why I need to right click here and click on list access so that I have now access to the full list of curves. Okay. Beautiful. And once we have, are here, now what we need to figure out is 
how to loft a curve, how to loft a B rep through a set of curves. So how do we do that? Well, we either know how to do that or we explore the autocomplete or we can start with the documentation, which is typically a good place to start. So I'm going to type here loft in the documentation and see what comes up. And I can see that there's a bunch of brep.create from loft methods that look promising to me. So because what I want is a brep created from a loft method. So I'm going to click here and you can see that there the create from loft method has two overloads. The one that I landed in has a lot of information, tangents, brep, trims, whatever. Maybe this one is a little too much. Let me try the other one. The other one looks a little better, a little, because create from loft, it takes an input, it takes an enumerable of curves, so something that can iterate over curves, or a list, an array, whatever, so it takes a bunch of curves. Then it takes two points, the start and the end points, I'm not sure what that means. Let me look at the documentation. Optional starting point for a loft. Oh, interesting, I didn't know I could choose points for the beginning or the end of the loft. Honestly, I'm not sure what that really means, but it looks like if you don't want to include that start point, you can just use point3d.unset. All right, so it turns out that this is optional, so maybe it's not, I'm not bothering too much with that. Loft type will tell me which type of loft do I want to perform, which looks like one of the options that I have here in the vanilla version, loft type here, which can be normal, loose, tight, straight, uniform. And as I can see, it's of the loft, it's of the type loft type, which if I click here, I can see that it's an enumeration. So I can choose between normal, loose, tight, etc., etc., and then um, and then just um, choose what kind of shape the B rep fits through those curves. And then last but not least, a boolean whether if I want the last curve to be connected to the first one or not. So this one looks very doable to me. A couple of things that I would like to note from the documentation is that first of all, this is a static method. So I will be calling it as we have seen before from the brep class. So brep.create from loft. The other thing that I would like to highlight is that what it's giving me back is not one brep. It's giving me an array of breps. This is because as we have seen in the past, if the curves are all one after the other, very clean, etc. Very likely the result will be just one B rep. But if they're intersecting and if there's like messiness with the original curves, maybe the result is actually several split B reps uh, with no continuity. So the solver will be the one who will decide that for us. So I think this method is quite doable and it's the one that I'm going to um, that I'm going to implement. So let's do it. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to plug in the curves and I don't know what this is, blah, blah, blah. So I think it just, it's just getting confused. All right. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to say brep dot and I'm going to create from loft. That's what it was that we did, right? Create from, what is loft? Create from loft. All right. I'm going to do that. I open parentheses and then the first input is the list of curves. So that's going to be C. The second point is the start point. Remember that that was optional and it said, the documentation said that if we didn't want to use it, just set it to point 3D unset. This is because, as I explained in my previous video, I believe, point 3D is a struct and structs, struct types cannot be null. So Rhino gives us this special point that is almost as a, as a null point. It's called the unset so that you can define a point that doesn't really exist, but you can fit it to places where they need points. So that's why I'm going to say point 3D dot onset. All right. And that's going to be for the start point. I'm going to do another one for the end point. So that was onset. Then the next parameter is the loft type. All right. For the time being, I'm going to hard code it. So it's going to be loft type normal, for example. And then the last one is going to be whether if I want it close or not. For this one, I'm going to say false. All right. And that's it, I think. Now, remember that this method returns 
uh, a an array of B reps, right? So I'm going to have to catch the return of this into a variable. B rep array uh, lofts is going to be equal to all this stuff here. And because I'm out of space, I'm going to be just entering here some kind of um, new line character. And then the, the output L is going to be equal to those that array that I just set. Let's try this. Whoa, whoa, boom, whoa, it works. And it looks like it is overlapping with the original one, which means that I think we did a good job. All right. But um, at this point, we're a bit more refined uh, parametric designers, computational designers. So I would like to not have hard coded stuff here. I don't like hard coding. So can we add inputs to this component for the loft type and for the periodicity? Is that something we can do? I believe we can. So let's say loft type, that's going to be T and uh, periodic, is it closed? That's going to be P. The loft type is going to be of the type integer. Remember, enums are represented by numbers, so we can convert from numbers, integers, very easily to enums. And P is going to be, whether if it's periodic or not, that's going to be Boolean. And because we want the same parameter for all the curves, that's why these are going to remain item, and these are also going to remain item. Well, with that, we can probably now plug in here a couple sliders. So for example, I'm going to plug in here an integer slider for the type. And we, I'm also going to plug in here so that we have the same. And a Boolean toggle. Ooh, it's been a long day. Uh, and a Boolean toggle for the periodic or periodic or whether if it's closed, which I believe is this one right here. Okay, a closed loft. All right, so if I turn this on, then the original, now it's a closed loft. And if I move this, you see number one is a loose fit. So you see it's very different. So let's try to replicate all of this in our component. So let's try to replicate first the type of loft. So as we saw in previous videos, what we can do is we can say loft type loft lt is going to be equal to casting to loft type to casting the value that is coming for t. All right. And then instead of loft type normal, we will use here lt. If I do that, you can see that now the two B reps, the one from the top and the one from the bottom, are both uh, matching. Okay, so that's great. So we have um, the type also control. And then the last thing we want is, well, this parameter, which is going to be super easy. So here, P, which is defining whether it fits periodic or not, instead of the hard code, we just plug it in right away. And then close, not close. Normal, loose, developable, blah, 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 whatever. So Boop, boop. All right. So it looks like this is working as well. Okay. Beautiful. So with this, I think these two examples covered well the idea of defining components that instead of taking single inputs, they take lists of data as inputs so that internally we can operate with the whole list at once. And this will be very helpful for operations that like we have seen lofting over a bunch of curves, calculating stuff based on a list of numbers, generating geometry that interpolates or flows through many other geometries, etc., etc. The sky is the limit at this point. All right. Beautiful. With this, I think that's all I wanted to say for this video. Um, I believe in the next video, we're going to take a look at the other data structure that we can work with, which is data trees, which is specifically for Grasshopper, okay? And then after that, we may just do another, another batch of exercises, all right? Thank you very much. If you like what you saw, consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications, giving a comment, saying hi on Discord, uh, sharing a story, reposting, uh, you know, modern 21st century social media kind of stuff, all right? Thank you very much, 
and see you on the next video. Bye.